An increasing number of Americans in need of organ transplants are now facing a new requirement before they can get the procedure, being vaccinated against COVID-19. Several hospitals are bumping patients who refuse the vaccine either down or off crowded organ wait lists. In Colorado, one such patient, Lilani Lutali, has been taking her case to the public. The 56-year-old is in stage five of chronic kidney disease, both she and her donor refusing the vaccine, citing religious objections and uncertainty about safety and effectiveness. Colorado State Representative Tim Geithner made public the letter she was sent by UC Health and said this on Facebook Live. This is life-saving care. Um, and that's incredibly frustrating, incredibly sad, incredibly disgusting uh, that UC Health uh, would make this type of a uh, decision uh, and impact an individual uh, in such a dramatic uh, and profound way. Lutani has antibodies from having had COVID and says, quote, I feel like I'm being coerced into not being able to wait and see and that I have to take the shot if I want this life-saving transplant. Joining me now, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, CNN's chief medical correspondent and author of the new book, World War C, Lessons from the COVID-19 Pandemic and How to Prepare for the Next One. Dr. Gupta, I was reading the book as this case was unfolding. And in the book, you've got a whole chapter where you go through the myths about COVID. And one of them is this, I've already had COVID, so why bother with the vaccine? Here's this transplant controversy where the patient says exactly that. How do you mm. see it? Well, first of all, I, I don't think that people should frame this as, as being a punishment to the unvaccinated, which I think is sometimes how this is interpreted. There's lots of, you know, uh, even pre-pandemic, there were vaccination requirements because when someone gets a transplant, they then get immunosuppressive drugs and a, a, a vaccine treatable illness could be worsened, causing severe illness or even death in those situations. So I think that's an important point to, to make. Also the religious uh, exemptions, you know, it's interesting, there's no major religion, Michael, that actually prohibits vaccinations. I think what's at issue there specifically is the use of fetal cell lines in the development of the vaccines. And, and that does happen with some of these COVID-19 vaccines, but the Vatican weighed in on this specifically. I don't know what religion this patient is specifically, but Pope Francis weighed in and said, these vaccines are acceptable even if fetal cell lines are used in this manner. But this last issue you raised, natural immunity, it's interesting. I mean, there's been data that's come out that says if you have natural immunity, you've had COVID in the past, you have natural immunity, you have probably pretty good protection, at least for a period of time. What seems to be at issue though, uh, Michael, is that we still don't know how long that protection lasts, nor do we know the breadth of that protection, meaning how good does it protect against the, the uh, variants, uh, Delta variant, for example, if you had had an exposure to Alpha or one of the earlier variants. We just don't have the data yet, and I think that's what transplant centers are sort of grappling with. We have a known entity with the vaccine. It is known to be safe and effective. Some six billion shots have now been given out around the world, and I think it's why ultimately uh, the American Society of, uh, of Transplant Medicine, they say everyone should be vaccinated. They can just make a recommendation. They have no mandate power, but they just recommend everyone should be vaccinated for all those reasons. It's thorny for sure, but that's how at least these uh, major scientific organizations land on it. Something else from the book, if I may, you quote Dr. Robert Redfield explaining to you that it makes no sense for a pathogen to go from a wild animal to a human with such efficiency. And this, of course, you know, Dr. Gupta is in your conversation about the Wuhan lab. What's the short version of where you come out on the origin hmm. as of what you know now? Well, I, I think if I had to place a bet, Michael, I would still say this likely spilled over from animals to humans. Why? And naturally occurring. Why? Because that's how most pathogens have emerged in the past. That's just, you know, the, the odds, playing the odds. The, 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 the summary of it is that there is a, a real lab leak theory out there that this may have been studied in a lab and then leaked. One way that that could be sort of dispensed with if the Chinese government wanted that would be to open the labs, provide all the data, put up this database that went down in September of 2019, put it back up. Was there any evidence of this particular virus in that database? The problem is they haven't done it. Uh, there's just a huge amount of opacity around this issue. And I, you know, I think that's fueling a lot of suspicion, frankly, understandably. And also, you know, I, I covered SARS back in 2003, Michael, the original SARS. 
And um, there was a lot of opaqueness at that point as well. It took months for the Chinese government to actually disclose that this pathogen was circulating. There's evidence of that here as well. They took, they took time before they actually alerted the world. That's, that's just gonna raise people's suspicions. So bottom line, I still think this likely spilled from animals to humans because of historically, that's the case. But why this, what seems like a cover up in terms of this Wuhan Institute of Virology? I learned a lot from your book. We all have our own COVID stories, except ours don't involve Francis Ford Coppola. I'll leave that as a tease <laughs> so that people read the story themselves. Thanks so much for being here. You got it, thank you.